Well, I think it's good for us to uh, start uh, with God's word. And I want to uh, take us just at the beginning to Daniel uh, chapter nine, which seems to me to be relevant and appropriate to um, the circumstances in which we find ourselves. So Daniel uh, chapter uh, nine. I'm sure like um, uh, me, you're all feeling frustrated uh, with this lockdown, that it seems to be um, uh, going on longer than we might have hoped. It's easy for us to feel a degree of disappointment that the lockdown is not being relaxed and we have to recalibrate our expectations. But very often the case is God's timings are not the same as our timings and the outworking of God's plan is often longer than expected. That's uh, something that we're reminded of, of in Daniel chapter 9. I know that the situation in Daniel is not identical to ours, but there are some uh, parallels. Uh, Daniel is um, in exile in Babylon, and he's reached a point at which he thinks he's uh, nearing uh, the end. C can I urge you to kind of mute your microphones, those who are there, otherwise we can hear everything that's happening in the background, that'd be great. Um, uh, uh, Daniel is um, in exile, he thinks he's nearing the end of exile. But what he discovers is that in God's purposes, this period of exile is going to be far longer than he might have expected. I don't have time to read the whole passage, but I'm going to read from Daniel chapter 9, verse 19 through to verse 24. So the end of Daniel's prayer, Lord, listen, Lord, forgive, Lord, hear and act. For your sake, my God, do not delay because your city and your people bear your name. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and making my request to the Lord, my God, for his holy hill. While I was still in prayer, Gabriel, the man I'd seen in the earlier vision, came to me in swift flight about the time of the evening service. He instructed me and said to me, Daniel, I've come to you to give you insight and understanding. As soon as you began to pray, a word went out, which I've come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. Seventy sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy place. Now, four things just to quickly note from that passage. It begins uh, in Daniel chapter nine with Daniel's expectation. That's really verses one to three. Daniel's reading his Bible. Um, he's reading the scripture of Jeremiah. And as he reads it, um, uh, he uh, uh, thinks he understands that the exile is going to last 70 years. Um, and that's understandable, given that that's the surface apparent meaning of um, the passage of the letter that Jeremiah uh, wrote to the exiles. Um, uh, but that then leads um, uh, Daniel into petition in verses uh, 4 to 19. Uh, in, on the back of that understanding of God's scriptural promise, Daniel turns to God in prayer. He thinks it's near the end of exile. So he prays uh, to the Lord. He confesses the sin of the people. But the heart of his prayer, the heart of his petition is a, a, a call to God to keep his covenant promises, to do what he has said. As so often in the Bible, prayer is asking God to do what he's already promised uh, to do. And as we saw in verse 19, the very heart of his prayer is the prayer, do not delay. It's a call for God to act quickly. Well, Daniel uh, finishes his prayer and it immediately gives way to, unexpectedly, um, the breaking in of Revelation um, in uh, chapter 9 and verse 20 to 27. Uh, Daniel has finished his prayer and God responds by sending additional revelation. Um, additional revelation through the um, uh, uh, Gabriel, the angel, which uh, reveals to Daniel that the exile will not last a, a period of 70 literal years, but will be uh, a period of 70 weeks of uh, years. Gabriel is, um, as it were, unpacking and exposing God's original authorial intent in the prophet, prophecy of Jeremiah. Um, there's going to be a return to the land, but that won't be the end of um, exile. There's going to be a much longer period of time before um, uh, there is the restoration uh, uh, for God's people. Now, of course, we're not in the same situation. We've not received new uh, special revelation. But I do think there's a parallel that as the government announces its plans for um, uh, sort of the lockdown and the relaxation, God's providential purposes are revealed. Um, God is uh, sovereign. And as we um, have these, uh, this new information, in a sense, um, uh, there's something of God's providential purposes that is being made known to us in a way that wasn't the case before, which will change our expectations and our uh, understanding. Well, what, what, what then finally is the application? In fact, we don't have um, uh, uh, anything that says specifically how Daniel responded. 
in some ways this seems like a case of unanswered prayer daniel's pray do not delay and yet uh, god says it's going to last much longer of course it's not that god is failing in his promises it's not that god from his perspective is delaying he is um, accomplishing his sovereign purpose and uh, unfolding and revealing it and in many ways the um, a response in the book of daniel is simply to keep trusting in god's sovereign plan that's actually been the message of the book of daniel from beginning to end um, uh, god works out his purposes and he's going to keep on working out his uh, purposes he's the one um, uh, who uh, is going to accomplish his purpose he promises daniel that there will be a time of restoration sin will uh, be dealt with there will be a time when the anointed one comes there will be a time in which the holy place is anointed god will accomplish his purposes in his sovereign will in his sovereign timing and as we might feel frustrated What's essential is that we trust that God is in control. And Daniel's invited to consider and understand. And that's what we're called to do. He had a, a life of seeing the sovereignty of God at work. He saw empires come and go, kingdoms rise and fall. He saw God fulfilling his uh, promises. And how much more can we see that in the light of the fulfillment of these prophecies? We can see that Christ has indeed come. God has worked out his purpose which gives us confidence that he will work out his purpose in the future. So we need to cling to and trust in the sovereignty of God in all that's happening. Let's uh, pray um, uh, as we uh, come together and uh, begin to move to our more practical uh, uh, sort of part of this webinar. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you and praise you that the book of Daniel reassures us that you are the sovereign God in control of all things. Thank you that timing is in your hands. What, what feels like delay is not delay to you, but the way you're fulfilling your promises. Thank you that we can see uh, in Daniel that you're sovereign over all things. Thank you that we can see that in the unfolding of salvation history. Particularly, thank you that we live in the light of the fulfillment of these promises with the coming of the Lord Jesus and the beginnings of the restoration um, as your people are gathered, as you make your dwelling with them by your spirit. Thank you that we can be confident that you will accomplish your ultimate purpose of gathering your people um, uh, when there will be a great day of judgment and a resurrection and a new creation please help us to live confidently in the light of that and um, please grant us um, wisdom as we um, uh, uh, gather together for this webinar help us to understand the situation in which we find ourselves and how is your people trusting your purposes we should respond in jesus name amen Well, I want to move on from there to talk in this first section about how might the lockdown be relaxed for churches. And in some ways, I'm wanting to update you on um, the latest government advice. Um, help us to understand what's happening, why it's happening and what might happen um, in the future. Last week at the uh, webinar, I, I indicated that I thought that the um, lockdown would last longer than was expected. And that was confirmed in the Zoom call that I had with number 10 Downing Street on Wednesday afternoon with about 40 or 50 church leaders. It was very clear that things were not going to change in any significant degree for uh, some time. Now government advice has been published and we can see that churches are not going to be able to gather physically before July the 4th at the very earliest. And it seems uh, highly likely that gathering in the way we did before the lockdown um, uh, will not occur um, uh, probably before um, the end of this year. And I think we just need to recalibrate our expectations in the light of this. But the question is, how should we respond to what is happening and the way that the lockdown is being um, relaxed? Um, and I want to suggest there are kind of um, uh, five uh, ways um, that we need to think about this, five potential ways that we can respond, things that we uh, need to do. The first way that we might respond and the way some are responding is with resentment at the uh, way that um, uh, the lockdown is uh, working out. Um, here there's a, a danger of um, increasing frustration and anger on the part of church leaders that we're not being allowed to meet. I detect that in some posts, um, uh, in some tweets, and there are a variety of reasons why people might be feeling resentful. For some, they seem to think that the case has not been made strongly enough for the government um, that we ought to be allowed to meet and that that call has been um, ignored. Well, I can assure you, I personally made the case last Wednesday. I challenged the Minister for Faith um, uh, when he compared churches to pubs in terms of where he saw them fitting in on the um, spectrum. Re uh, representations have been made um, to the government. The government has listened to those uh, representations. I think the reality is we just need to recognize that they don't agree uh, with uh, those representations 
and what churches would like to see um, happen. So um, uh, don't be resentful uh, as if representations have not been made. Secondly, I, I think there are some for whom they are sort of resentful because they basically think that the um, uh, lockdown is either unnecessary or unjustified. Johnny, I think we might be further on in the presentation. That was the original sheet with the headings. There were some sub points coming on, but you might want to just see where that's at. But um, for some, they thought that the lockdown was unnecessary, um, uh, either because you know, COVID-19 never really required it, sort of, uh, uh, it was just like a kind of flu, um, uh, uh, or because it's an unjustified infringement of liberty, the case that former kind of Supreme Court Judge Jonathan Sumption was making um, earlier uh, this week. So there are some who feel that this is just simply uh, wrong, that um, uh, there should be a lockdown um, uh, at all, uh, uh, and an infringement on um, our religious freedom, um, and uh, would prefer people to be allowed just to make their own choices. Another reason for resentment is maybe that people um, uh, are resentful because they see the restrictions are not being enforced against others. Maybe they see shops, public transport, factories, garden centres being permitted to open, or they think it's not being enforced consistently, that there are others who are breaking it who seem to get away with it. Or they see different approaches being taken, maybe in other parts of the UK, um, in the devolved administrations or in other countries like the States or Germany. Um, uh, for some they're resentful because of a lack of consideration of perhaps special circumstances for churches. They think um, churches ought not to be treated like pubs and entertainment, um, entertainment venues that um, we're of value to society and ought to have a special place in national life. And there is a resentment that's not understood. But I don't think resentment is necessarily the universal response. For some, there's actually a relief, perhaps, that there isn't the pressure to start meeting when it might be unsafe. I think there are some who will be relieved that there's been no relaxation. There's already a pushback against what the government has been saying. Um, uh, those who um, think that um, uh, it is uh, uh, kind of um, unsafe or unfeasible to be able to gather safely, we see that in relation to schools. And I think um, in our churches, it may be the case that our congregations are not perhaps as gung-ho as we might like to think. Um, uh, uh, as we get prayer requests in from churches uh, to FIEC, it's interesting that there's a, a, an increasing change of tone as more and more report bereavements, deaths, infection, and, and perhaps a greater fear and concern for vulnerable people in the life of churches. So um, we can react with um, resentment, but it seems to me that we need to actually um, instead react with realism. We need to have a realism about um, uh, what is happening. Um, uh, we need to have a realism about the likely length of the lockdown, the challenges of reopening, um, and why it is we're not a higher priority. I think understanding will be helpful to it. So it's clear that there's going to be no uh, real change before the 4th of July at the earliest, um, in England at, at least. And the uh, government changes um, reflect very little actual change in the lockdown. It pretty much amounts to nothing more than being able to go outside more often, maybe meet one person outside at a distance of two metres. Certainly small groups meeting in homes uh, are not going to be um, permitted. And if the government allows, for example, uh, limited bubbles of social groups to be able to meet, many people are going to face a difficult choice between gathering with members of their family or gathering with members of their church. So I think it's clear there's going to be no return to pre-lockdown gatherings for a long time. The Bishop of London um, on Friday indicated probably not before the end of the year. And it's clear from the government strategy um, and report that the government basically regards churches as being equivalent to cinemas, concert venues, hospitality venues. And as I said, it's easy for us to be resentful of that because we think we don't want to be compared with what we see as a voluntary social activity. But I think it's important that we realise that it is understandable why government regards us as the equivalent of cinemas, pubs and hospitality. Um, basically, that's because of the way that um, we gather and what we do when we gather. When we gather, um, uh, our mingling and interacting with one another is much similar to a, a cinema, a theatre, an indoor sports event, often with a cafe um, thrown in. Uh, it's not surprising that many of our churches hire cinemas or theatres as their venue. The government's concern is not with the worth of what we do, but with the potential for spreading the virus. And in that sense, we are not like shops or garden centres. When we gather as church, our, 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 our purpose is not transactional. 
I was in a uh, home base on um, uh, sort of Saturday seeing the way they implement social distancing. And the whole aim is to get around the shop with minimal contact with others and to conduct a transaction. That's not how churches function when um, they gather. We're not like shops. We're not like garden centres. In some sense, I think the government is right in their understanding of what churches are like. And in a secular society, the, 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 the kind of government doesn't really value the social utility of churches as we value it. Um, for us, issues like preaching, worship, evangelism, gathering together are important. For government, what matters about the social utility of churches is their ability to care for people in society, food banks, homeless shelters, um, uh, and many of those works have been continuing. The reality is that people have been affected at church and have died. Um, uh, church gatherings have been responsible for the spread. We know of a church in the West Midlands where just before the lockdown, 10 deaths occurred after a gathering of the church family. Many churches are, are congregations of the predominantly elderly and have disproportionate number of vulnerable people. So um, I think um, it is therefore unlikely that we're going to change the government's mind. Certainly not simply by shouting louder. It's unlikely to make any difference. Well, that brings us to the regulations themselves. Um, uh, the uh, regulations that the government has put on social distancing, I think, are going to make it quite difficult for churches to gather, um, uh, even if they wanted to. Um, View Cinemas this week spoke about what they would need to do to reopen, and I think there are parallels for churches. There'll be a link to that resource uh, at the end. So um, the social distancing requirements are going to make it difficult. Two metres apart, seating and spacing. Many churches are already nearly full. Uh, congregational singing may not be possible because of the risk of spreading. One of the key things that we're missing, there may be an expectation of wearing masks in enclosed spaces. Deep cleaning arrangements after buildings have been used is going to be a significant burden on churches. I think there are going to be particular problems for churches that hire buildings because uh, will owners really be willing to um, uh, allow them to uh, make use of their building? So I think actually we need to uh, face the fact that it may well be that even when the, re uh, the uh, lockdown is relaxed, our virtual gatherings may achieve more that we want in practice than physically gathering. I think it's amazing what many churches have been uh, able to achieve moving online. Compared with pubs, cinemas, aviation, we've been able to keep the majority of our core activities going. If you want an analogy, it seems to me it's quite like a cinema that has had to close its doors, but has reinvented itself as Netflix. And uh, in that way, um, we have uh, been able to keep going more easily than many others. It may be that even when we're able to gather physically, uh, what we would do, and because of the restrictions, will be far less effective for the whole church body than what we can do at the moment. The whole church may not be able to come together. Well, that, that's just a brief overview of where things are in um, the UK. Um, I want to just give an opportunity very briefly. I know that Scotland and Wales are different. Andy Hunter in Scotland, is there anything you want to add that would add to that from a Scottish perspective? Steve Levy in Wales, is there anything you'd want to add? Just a very brief moment of opportunity for a comment. Thanks, John. Yeah, as people know, Scotland is really basically just England pre last Sunday, nothing has changed here. The advice is the same as it was uh, pre Sunday for the whole of the UK, uh, which means all the kind of restrictions uh, are in place. The only easing up has been for unlimited exercise, but gatherings of more than two people are still prohibited. There has been some activity from church leaders, West of Scotland Gospel Partnership, have also noted Roman Catholic bishops have been engaging. Uh, with government uh, just to try and make the case. And I think probably the benefit of that, as John is noting, isn't so much that we will get any special favours, but even just to raise the profile that churches are a constituency that are affected by this and need to be considered rather than being forgotten about. Uh, I was smiling a little bit, uh, ironically, looking at the Scottish government uh, website on advice uh, that there is more advice for beekeepers on the Scottish government website than there is for churches uh, about COVID-19. Uh, so basically everything is the same as it was uh, in Scotland, but there are representations being made uh, and hopefully that will at least uh, bring the issue of our activities onto the agenda uh, for government. 
uh, even if we don't get any immediate kind of concessions or uh, movement. Okay, thanks, Eddie. Anything from you, Steve? Yeah, I, I think in Wales, I spoke to a few uh, pastors. I spoke to Dave Gobbett. I think the general consensus is it's even slower in Wales. Uh, and there's a, a sort of underlying resistance to the UK government's speed. Uh, so it's even slower with us uh, than anywhere else. Nothing really to add than that, except that, uh, yeah, that's where we are. Uh, I don't see it. It's certainly, yeah, just slower and a general resistance. Uh, that seems to be the attitude okay. of the Assembly. Thanks very much. Um, let's um, uh, then uh, pick up. I think um, as we therefore think about the context in which we find ourselves, key things I want to say are we do need to take the risks seriously of um, uh, kind of gathering and, and what is involved, um, especially if we were to choose to try to break the rules or be casual about the uh, rules and particularly as church leaders and trustees, we need to take those issues seriously because the buck stops with us. It's worth recognising there are legal risks that we might face. So government is um, introducing heavier fines to enforce the lockdown regulations. So some more freedom is being given, but a bigger stick is being employed. I think there is potential civil liability if we are negligent or reckless in relation to the risks of the virus. Uh, it's clear that some firms are reluctant to open because they don't want the possibility of liability if employees become uh, infected um, and sadly and tragically went on to die from the virus. Maybe because social distancing wasn't really possible or they couldn't really um, enforce it and maintain it. If we meet, we'll need to be very careful in undertaking risk assessments and making sure that we comply with uh, whatever criteria uh, we have adopted. Uh, we need to think through how will we deal with people who infringe the um, stipulations that we feel are necessary. So we can't afford to ignore the fact that there may well be legal risks and um, uh, insurance requirements for trustees if we treat this casually. But alongside that, and just as important, I think there's a danger of reputational risks for it. Um, uh, and what the public reaction will be to us as churches if we break the rules and people die. I think if we um, flaunt and we are not careful with people, if tragically people were to be infected or to die, maybe their non-Christian relatives or the culture more widely, their um, view and attitude towards the church would be incredibly negative. And it will get covered in the media as there's more and more um, at scrutiny of um, how the lockdown is operating. So finally, um, in the light of all of that, how should we respond? Um, I want to suggest a, a number of key things here. Firstly, it seems to me, um, uh, we need to recognise the state doesn't have absolute authority. Um, we do have the ability to disobey if that is required to obey Christ. Where we do, we should expect to be punished by the authorities for our disobedience. But we shouldn't disobey simply because of our preference or our desire. And I think my judgment at the moment is it doesn't seem to me this is a time for civil disobedience. We don't have grounds for that. And therefore, um, it, it's right for us to submit and respect Romans 13, 1 Peter 2. Secondly, I think it's crucial that we explain to our church and plan accordingly, that we need our church people to help understand why we're in this situation, what it's likely to hold. Uh, we need to kind of, in a sense, almost calm down that negative aggression uh, that might be there on sort of tweets and Facebooks and in people's understanding. People just need to um, understand what's happening and why. Thirdly, I think we can um, make representations to government Andy was talking about that. We have the right to explain, um, protest and lobby. So um, write to your MP, help them understand the limitations and effect on churches. I'll continue to represent with um, number 10 Downing Street. As we do that, can I urge you to be polite, to be understanding of the government's dilemma, to understand that simply being shriller will not get us what we um, uh, kind of want. Um, in a way, it's not that there are new things to be said. What needs to be said has been said already. Um, uh, bear that in mind. Um, you could, of course, refuse to comply, um, but I think the danger of refusing to comply is that if that is the case, we risk ultimately a longer, tighter lockdown because it's clear that compliance depends or, or relaxation depends on compliance. But lastly, I think this is really important. Give thanks for what we can do as churches. It's easy for us to see the negatives. Uh, but in some ways in this situation, we're partly victims of our own flexible creativity in what we've been able to do. We're not like shut down pubs or cinemas. We've discovered the word of God is not changed, chained. We can still uh, preach and proclaim. Um, we can in some measure disciple and teach and encourage. Our church members are generally gracious, understanding and patient. And God is at work. 
I think we need to be um, uh, responding by just being thankful to God for everything that we can do as churches and help people to be um, uh, grateful and appreciative of that rather than solely seeing the uh, frustrations of um, uh, the lockdown restrictions. We've been giving some thinking to this uh, for about a month, um, anticipating what's coming or what's not coming. I didn't claim any expertise other than just having got some help, uh, uh, had, having spent a lot of time thinking about it. So um, uh, we've been working on several assumptions. The first, of course, that the Lord is completely sovereign and that what's happening is not an accident. Um, secondly, that we're going to continue to follow the government guidelines for the sake both of our walk and our people and our witness. And it's just worth remembering, I think, that when people say they're following the science, they're not simply following biomedical science, but behavioural science as well. And we need just to bear that in mind, that, that there's effects of what they're doing, uh, not simply out, uh, of, the, of the decisions they're making and the, and the stuff that's coming out, um, not just vaccine development and so on. Uh, the third assumption is that social distancing, therefore, is going to continue for many months and probably become the new normal well into next year or even permanently if there is no vaccine which is a significant possibility next slide please johnny um uh, the other assumption that we've made is that our work as a church is fundamentally to reach the lost and make disciples and present everyone mature in christ that won't be a surprise to you guys of course um and it, but it may well be that we want to use this as an opportunity for root and branch evaluation of how we do that now that the boat has stopped rocking and hopefully people aren't going to fall out. Um, but we've at least been trying to look at the things that we are doing now that we know are good, um, but that have had to stop. And for those things that are working well, as far as we can see, we want to see what benefit, whatever it is we're doing has been bringing and how, if it has to stop, we can replace that benefit. So, um, with an equivalent benefit or an equivalent activity. So, for example, for us, uh, since our church foundation, we've we've had a monthly church lunch that everybody has stayed to practically for the last 15 years or so. And actually, it has proved to be hugely strategic as an inform for informal fellowship across age groups and social situations. People have made friends and, and so it's, it's been a really important thing. But of course, that's now got to stop. Um, so the question is, uh, how can we replace that? What's the equivalent thing we can put in place that will bring the same benefit? And trying to think imaginatively about that has been quite challenging. Can you move to the next slide, please, Johnny? Um, uh, the other thing that we're working on the basis of is that on, online is, is the new normal. And, and we've considered that if online is the new normal and is gonna be certainly a, if not the key means of ministry, um, we've got all the emergency stuff in place, borrowed cameras, equipment, and, you know, home Wi-Fi and all that kind of jack. Well, well, maybe we need to invest quite a lot more in online and that, and that may be investment of money and equipment. It may involve investment of more people being involved. We've got a tech team that is brilliant, but maybe it needs to get a bit bigger. Um, maybe we need to get people a bit more trained up, um, um, and maybe, probably, uh, if this is going to be a key point of ministry, then it's going to become a, a position for a church officer to head up, by which I mean, you know, an online deacon um, or whatever. Just, just in other words, put pouring a bit more resource and investment into what's going to become a key means of ministry. Um, when we come to meet physically, it's the next slide, please, Johnny. Um, when we come to meet physically, obviously, the thing to think about, first of all, is... Um, uh, is capacity. Our building in Chippenham has a capacity, if we absolutely pack it, of about 300 people. Now we can get, you know, average Sunday 150, 160, maybe up to 180, um, but we know the building could hold 300. Well, actually, with social distancing, if we're sitting people in family groups and so on, then we think 60 people is 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 ambitious. And that has all sorts of knock-ons for us. Um, of course, some people won't be coming anyway because they're going to have to self-isolate uh, self and our shielding. But even so, that will have some knock-ons. Uh, knock-ons to things like, um, we don't currently run multiple morning services, but maybe we're going to have to, to cycle everyone through. Thanks, Johnny. Um, uh, how are we going to seek people? I'll, I'll mention more of that in a second. Um, in groups, in singles. Um, 
and still leaving room for visitors. We're working on the assumption that our evangelism, uh, our online evangelism that we're all, I hope, benefiting from in this time of lockdown, as we advertise on Facebook and Instagram and all that stuff, which we're trying to make the most of, um, social media to advertise, well, and draw people in. It, if that works and people are converted or people have a higher interest, then we want to make the side, we want them to turn up. So we, we're going to need to make sure that there's room for them. Um, and of course, the knock on implications, therefore, of uh, for stewarding, preaching and so on are huge. Next, next slide, please, Johnny. Um, physically meeting is going to throw up all sorts of questions. Just just uh, walking into a Sunday morning, for example, um, stewarding. Well, we're obviously not going to shake hands like the icon shows, are we? Um, but for us, actually, uh, we don't have a very large number of elderly people, but we have a few. And, and our stewarding team consists of about 50 percent elderly. Um, well, they're not going to be able to do that anymore. So who's going to be stewarding? Um, uh, are we going to need to um, mask them? Uh, uh, are people going to bring masks? To it looks like one what government said yes. Uh, should we have some available for those that don't have any? Um, what about seating? It's all very well saying seating in family groups. But what if couples turn up? What if singles turn up? How's it going to feel to singles turning up and you've got three family groups and then a chair on its own? Um, we need to think through that and how to integrate, how to make that work. Um, creation Sunday school happens concurrently for us. Uh, um, uh, they normally go out 20 minutes into the service. Um, how are we going to staff that? Some of our, our current Sunday school staff and, and creation staff are shielding or, or uh, won't be able to come. Uh, we're going to need volunteers. Uh, which parents are going to be willing to do that? Sunday school, I can see working at a socially distant. Creche definitely won't be able to. Um, some people would call creche a petri dish, uh, where families can just mix up viruses. Um, how is that going to work? Well, well, the implications of that actually, uh, for us actually, that children will stay in the service, that will change the nature of what we're doing in a service. We need to reflect that. Pretty clear now that singing, uh, in, uh, congregational singing is dangerous uh, as far as the virus is concerned. Um, so what does that mean? How do we praise the Lord. We just have to listen to piped music if we do gather physically from here on. What about refreshments? And again, a big deal for us, actually. It's been a, a really big thing for people self-serving. And so um, are we going to allow refreshments at all? Are we going to ban them? Um, what does that look like? How are people going to drink refreshments standing socially distanced? I've said the lunch already uh, will be stopped. Um, we're thinking through how to replace the fellowship aspect of that baptism. Um, one would hope that uh, in normal church life people are baptized regularly well how do you baptize people socially distant um, uh, is our uh, love of a full immersion going to have to be replaced with a, a distantly held bucket overhead or whatever we just you know things to think through from our point of view and then next slide Johnny please um, that's just Sundays what about midweek meetings um, outreach well that just covers just about you know, most of what we do midweek. Uh, mums and Tots, um, we've got a, a Facebook group for our Mums and Tots group, um, teddy bears picnics happening and things like that. But actually, um, what does that look like from now on? Is all our outreach going to move online? And is all our advertising for outreach going to move online? And what about for those who are not socially, um, uh, who are not socially connected online? Uh, could we, should we be thinking on how to equip? We've actually equipped one or two church members simply on how to get online. We're going to need to give more thought to that. Um, children's clubs, there are safeguarding issues with moving online. And we've started moving uh, heaven and earth to try and, to try and get that in place. Actually, our prayer meeting has benefited massively from being online. Maybe we're going to want to keep it there. Home groups, obviously. Holiday Bible Club, how are we going to do that? Seniors obviously aren't going to turn up anymore. Um, what seniors ministry can we continue and so on and so on and then finally other considerations just last slide Johnny please other considerations uh, John's already mentioned deep cleaning but what about cleaning between services um, which is obviously going to be necessary for running multiple services what about special events we need to think of protocols for running those we've got a kitchen refurbishment going on in our building um, do we stop that um, or do we do it while the building's empty we're, we're giving thought to that what resources should we be putting into that? Clearly, this will all have budgetary implications. And we haven't even begun to talk about the pastoral knock-ons, um, online addictions that are going to be heightened um, because of this. I've heard some horror stories of porn sites giving people free membership 
um, and this time um, there are people who are self-isolating who are clearly struggling and so on and so on. Um, okay, I mean, that, 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 they're the things that we've started to cycle through. A lot of them are questions. We've started to find answers, but fundamentally what we've done is try, first of all, I brought my elders on board and then we brought uh, the wider um, deacons and others involved in practical ministry on board and we're starting to bring them on the journey that we reckon is going to last several months just to start to rehearse these questions through. Okay, John, back to you. Great. Spencer, thank you um, so much. We've got uh, about 10 um, minutes or so for questions to Spencer and myself. Hopefully you've been sending questions to uh, Phil. We'd love to be able to engage with you. Uh, Phil, do you want to start moderating questions and sending them in our directions? Uh, absolutely. Uh, first one, Spencer, on the back of what you've just said, um, someone's asking, is it worth it? Would it not just be worth keeping everything online until 2021? Is, is it worth all the stress of, uh, of thinking that through for every church? What would your thoughts be, Spencer? Yeah, so sorry, a note I meant to, to raise is this, actually, that when going through this with one, uh, with one group of church officers, someone said this is getting back physically together is going to be a real ordeal. And I really hated that word, actually, um, because I think the inclination is, uh, well, why are we bothering? Uh, to meet physically and I uh, actually I've started to discuss with my elders how we're going to teach into that um, because we work on the basis I think that meeting together actually is, is really important I, I raised the point that um, when I was a kid uh, brethren behind the iron curtain went through terrible ordeals just so they could see one another and I I think they thought it was worth it I think it's worth it but from what that means for us is um, the preaching series which has been adapting to this situation um, in about a month's time we're going to start um, some work on how important it is to meet together as best we can so yeah I mean it clearly it's going to be a lot of hassle um, and the degree to which it's worth it is going to vary from place to place we think it's worth it as much as we can. What one for you John a couple of uh, questions coming in in different guises really about how we could do any sort of meeting together so people are talking about outdoor services uh, and smaller kind of gatherings in smaller groups how would you respond to that in terms of what you're picking up from government and the like just a couple of, I think firstly it's worth saying that smaller isn't necessarily better than bigger in actual fact there's a lot of evidence that the worst gatherings are gatherings of between 10 and 30 it's to do with the degree of interaction between people not the number of people who are there and again from the government perspective it's not simply about gathering it's about what happens when you gather how many contacts you have how much opportunity there is for the virus to be spread between people. So it's not simply about numbers and size. So for example, um, uh, speaking about meeting other people, it's been made clear you can meet one person outside at two meters distant. You can't have them in your home. You can't invite them around your home, even if you stay two meters distant. That's all part of this problem of the infection if you've got too much interaction between people closely. Um, outside services, I suspect the real challenge there is how on earth could you maintain the social distancing uh, as a crowd kind of gathers? You've got all of those problems that Spencer talked about in a building translated to outside of a building. Um, and I think, um, firstly, some people will not have facilities where they could do that. But once you start doing that in a public space, how are you gonna facilitate it? How are you gonna control it? Um, it will attract attention. So it sounds great. But there's a whole load of practical issues associated with how would you gather a group of people for that purpose um, and maintain compliance with what the government is saying about social distancing. Uh, and I think therefore this calculus between the advantage of gathering and doing what we're doing and what it's achieving already is one we've got to think through. Gathering is clearly better but there's a, a, a sense of how much of what we accomplish are we accomplishing? How much more effort and is it really feasible to meet in a different way? Would it would the benefit massively outweigh all of the costs and trouble of doing it? I think that's the tough question that we're going to face sort of down the line as the lockdown is more relaxed. Phil, can I just quickly ch chuck something sure. in? Uh, and, and that is that I was really disturbed by one couple who said to me, we're absolutely loving Sunday mornings. Uh, the kids play quietly and we just get both services and both uh, morning and evening and uh, the kids are enjoying themselves and we're enjoying ourselves and it's wonderful. Actually, I, th I was quite rocked by that um, because they're going to bring up a, a generation of children uh, who don't uh, 
um, pay any attention and who actually don't like church when we do physically meet. I think we, so we're starting to think about that with moving our Sunday school online and putting a different session in because it's just, it's crucial that people think strategically um, ab ab about what seeds they're sowing. Uh, just like to kind of, sorry, John, go on. I was going to say, I add to that, I think it's, I entirely agree with that. And it's also um, during this time, one of the things we can do is honestly ask the question, what are the barriers that mean that people find it difficult to come physically and the marginal things that stop them coming? Because we all know not all of our people come every week. Mm. And um, there might be things for us to learn about what are the obstacles, about the way we meet, the time we meet, the way we do things that are just putting in place those marginal barriers that people are discovering that they don't have to overcome online. We might need to change some of what we do mm -hmm. to make it easier for people to come physically when we can do that. Uh, John, we talked a bit about marriage last week and it yep. seems like the government are moving towards uh, easing some restrictions uh, on that. Obviously it's a big pastoral issue for a lot of our churches. Have you any uh, <laughs> thoughts on whether the government might move to make legal marriages uh, an online thing or whether they might just relax the numbers who could gather to make a, a legal marriage possible? Where do you think that's going to head? Um, I know nothing more than what the one minister who's spoken in public has said on that. In the Zoom consultations, the marriage issue has been brought up repeatedly so um, people understand the challenge of the marriage issue. Um, uh, all the response we've had is we will keep it under review and consider it. So I've got no inside knowledge as to what government is planning on doing. From the government minister's response, it looks as though there might be a willingness in June to allow some kind of minimalist marriages to go ahead in the same way as funerals. Certainly Evangelical Alliance has hinted at that on their piece uh, on this. That's all we know at this point. Um, but it's not confirmed, no data has been given, and I know nothing more than that. Uh, it's worth saying I've got dozens of questions, brothers and sisters. I'm, I'm not going to get through them all, so please forgive me for that. But this is an interesting one, John. Uh, how, how do we avoid speculating with people about when we might be able to gather back together? We want to be absolutely truthful. Is speculation helpful? What would your pastoral wisdom be on that to, to, to lead us here? Um, yeah, I think we can make it harder for people by speculating unhelpfully. I think as leaders, we need to just simply explain what the situation is um, and what we know, not to try to second guess, not to overly predict. Um, uh, we want to, I think, rightly express our desire together. But even in our praying and the way that we pray, let's not make speculation infiltrate our praying. Um, and let's not let our frustration infiltrate our praying in a way that doesn't help people. So I think we just need to be honest and straightforward. We need to say we don't know in many instances. Uh, we've got to live with that limitation of what we know and what we don't know. Um, and I think we set the example of tone and of helping people not to speculate um, uh, in, in ways that will ultimately be pastorally difficult because they'll build up expectations that may well be sort of subsequently uh, dashed. I would say in this kind of situation, it is better to have low expectations um, and see them exceeded than it is to have over optimistic expectations and have to roll back from them. Uh, John, have you made the point to number 10 that for Christians meeting together is actually a conscience issue? We know we can't meet together currently, but it's not just about a social gathering. We, 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 we don't want to give up the habit of meeting together. It's a conscience issue for us. Has that point been, been made, even if they may disagree with us? Uh, yes, but I think their response would be there are lots of groups that want to meet together very strongly. And that doesn't take away from the public health implications of what will happen if you do. Um, and I think actually they might well make the point that for many churches through online things, you're able to do many of the things that you um, uh, were already doing in a way that other sectors of the economy can't. So I think that may well be the case, but I, I just don't think it's a compelling argument with them given that their priority is to seek to minimise the opportunity for the virus to be spread. A practical question, uh, John or, or Spencer, do you think there's anything in the current regulations that means people can't come together at a church building, socially distanced, of course, to do the proper kind of recording uh, of Sunday morning services? So uh, in the lockdown, it was, I think, one person going to a building. Uh, could a small team, if they observed that, go to a building to, to, to do a, a proper recording for a Sunday? Spencer, do you have any? Yeah, I mean, I think it's. I, I think uh, we've taken it that. Uh, I mean, some churches have been doing this anyway during the lockdown, haven't they? Um, uh, we, I, I think there's a high degree of common sense actually, and the social distancing being required. 
Um, I do still think there is a major issue with singing. And when you do, when you read the studies on that, it's quite clear um, that singing is actually, if you're afraid of the virus, singing is the classic way to spread it. Um, but socially distancing, I think uh, it, that seems to be okay. Uh, comment out, the Church of England has allowed people to go into churches for that purpose. That's been part of their changed guidance. So I think, yes, we can say that that complies with what the government is saying, provided social distancing is still maintained. Uh, social distancing might mean that we can perhaps do a few more one-to-ones as pastors, perhaps at a distance uh, from people. Um, just some wisdom on how much of that pastors should seek to do. Um, somebody's quite rightly asking, if you do 10 one-to-ones a day like that, you're going to quickly be exhausted. What, what, where, what advice would you give to folk on how the easing of restrictions doesn't overburden and, and overwork people unhelpfully? Oh, this is just off the cuff on that. I think actually take advantage of Zoom and other facilities to do things with groups so that you don't become overly exhausted. So if it's about discipleship and support, unless it needs to be personal and private, why not try to do it with a few people rather than one um, for maximization? Just in terms of those one-to-ones, the rules are at the moment, well, the way you would do that is only in a public space two metres apart. So um, uh, sort of, uh, there are all sorts of limitations to the ability. To, the idea that you're going to sit on a park bench and have 10 people come to you and all sit two metres apart just doesn't seem very realistic. So don't think that one-to-ones are easy to do in the current context of what the regulations uh, kind of are, I think. Uh, any thoughts on evangelism, guys? A lot of folk asking about how we're, we're reaching people. I know there's some ideas been, been shared. Uh, any particular thoughts that folk could be looking at to, to reach those who are, who are not reached? Spencer, we've, do you want to comment yeah, on that? We, I mean, we've been, uh, so very simply, we've been um, just boosting adverts, uh, getting good quality adverts produced uh, by some of our design people and putting them on Facebook and boosting them. And actually, you can reach an enormous number of people for very little money very quickly. Um, although having said that, the most effective to draw people in uh, has undoubtedly been our people sharing with their friends. I think there's a real limitation with this, actually. Um, some of our folk have posted uh, uh, books to colleagues, others have leafleted their entire street and so on. But um, I want to encourage uh, social, um, uh, social uh, uh, online social uh, uh, stuff, Facebook and so on, Instagram, uh, for reaching people. And that does seem to be quite effective, providing people doing that with their friends. And drawing people in. Thank you. Um Thank you for those questions. I'm sorry we've not been able to answer all of your questions. We have wanted to try to keep this time to an hour. I know there'll be lot, there are lots of questions there. We're going to be doing this weekly, so um, there's lots of things for us to continue thinking about. So um, uh, with a longer lockdown, there'll be more opportunities for us to engage across a range of um, uh, issues. Just to remind you, this webinar has been recorded, so you can watch it again. It will be um, available for you to watch and use with um, your teams. It's also going to be uh, sort of turned into a podcast format so that it can be listened to rather than watched, which uh, hopefully will mean that people can, for example, listen to it while they're sort of, um, uh, and that will be easier for some to um, engage with. Uh, we've got a resources sheet that was shown earlier that is going to be made available that's just some interesting things you might want to read that pick up on the things we've been talking about um, here. Uh, next week, um, same time on Wednesday, we're going to be looking at um, Word and Sacrament. We're going to be thinking about Lord's Supper and Communion in a kind of virtual church context, and we're going to be thinking about preaching um, uh, online just to help one another think through some of the issues connected with that. We're hoping in subsequent weeks to do things looking at, for example, youth and children's ministry and how we continue that. I think evangelism and how we make the most of evangelistic opportunities would be another key area to devote um, an entire webinar to. Again, please keep giving us um, uh, kind of the things you want us to be addressing and you want us to be uh, helping you with. We're here to serve you and uh, we want to be able to, um, uh, to do that. Um, uh, we'll finish there. Spencer, would you be happy to just pray for it at the end of this webinar? Father, we want to thank you so much for your love to us and the Lord Jesus. The fact that we have a gospel to proclaim, the fact that we have a future hope that is certain in him. We pray, Lord, that you'd help us to continue to trust you, to love you, to honor you. We thank you that you're a kind, gracious and compassionate God. And we thank you that you love us more than we can begin to understand. Lord, we pray that you will help us to be faithful uh, uh, pastors, uh, helpful husband, uh, faithful husbands, uh, faithful um, parents, uh, faithful 
uh, to the gospel, faithful to you. And Lord, uh, we pray that you'll use our churches for the furtherance of the gospel, for the extension of the kingdom and the glory of your name. Give us wisdom and grace and glorify yourself, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, thank you for joining us. Um, please be assured of our prayers for you as you continue to minister. Please do use the FIEC resources. We keep them updated with information about coronavirus. Please use the FIEC prayer function so that we can be praying for one another. But trust the Lord will bless you in your continued ministry and service of Christ. Thank you.